like you. Really? I doubt that. You have more power than you can imagine, Jean. The question is, will you control that power? Or let it control you? You deserted me. We had a deal. That's no reason to- Yes, it is. You pissed me off. What was I supposed to do? Take it like a man? Christ, I gave you everything I got. I gave you more than anybody's ever given you. And what do I get in exchange? A little thank you, a little gratitude. I'll tell you what I get. I get screwed! Oh, cut the crap, okay? Just tell me, what do you want from us? I want somebody to do these shirts! That's what I want! I want somebody to pay a little attention to me! I want a little respect! kind. Welcome, everybody, to our inaugural attention convention. Uh, by now, you may be wondering a couple of things. What the hell is an attention convention? Why are you politely sitting here? Things like that. Attention to us is the invisible obvious of the advertising and media industry. It's something that is most crucial to the building of brands and yet most in decline in our modern media marketplace. And that split between the need and the supply is why a whole group of us left very respectable, high-paying, uh, stable jobs uh, to start a new company, uh, to build a new media. Yeah, I was once a very respectable guy. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to believe. Um, a whole new kind of media company that is based not just on the concept of reach, but on the concept of attention. And the very simple question we began with is, if reach is relatively infinite in today's media landscape, but attention is becoming progressively scarcer, why can't brands buy attention from media companies instead of the increasingly ironic term of impressions. And when you think about attention, when you think about the current of consumer attention, and you think about those scenes that, that Brett and Peter very kindly um, let us use for the opening, when Jack Nicholson is throwing his tantrum you're, you're enthralled, you're single focused. That's all you're watching. It's having a visceral effect on you. Think about that on the spectrum of attention and banner ads on the other side. Think about the diaspora of attention 
that we're facing right now. And yet we spent $25 billion last year buying the latter. Reaching people, having an impression on people when they're checking their mail or they're lost and they're looking for directions on a map or they're looking for a new job. Times reaches when they're not necessarily in the mood to hear from a brand. And attention to us is that invisible obvious. It's the thing that's not being talked about, which should be the lens of media. It's what brands need most, and it's what media companies should be giving them. We're going to explore the concept of attention from a commercial basis. We're going to talk to a lot of, uh, you know, in my opinion, the smartest marketers in the world today. Um, we're going to hear from filmmakers and um, entertainment leaders who have built careers on capturing attention, not for 30 seconds, but for hours at a time. We're going to explore this from a number of different angles today. And we're going to try to take you on a journey um, that explores the topic of attention and then brings it back to the beta wave view on attention and shows a little bit about how we're approaching the market. Um, I, I think we covered it. There's an attention crisis. FYI, attention crisis, OK? Uh, uh, and um, uh, I, the question which I think most of us are here to, um, to focus on today is, is what the heck does that mean for advertising? I no longer run a big agency, so I'm not allowed legally to answer this question. So I'm going to invite up to the stage um, a, an old colleague um, who is, who's written her own notes on an introduction. She is now a very powerful client. She no longer works for me. I can't boss her around. I should start showing her respect. It goes on. It goes on. But ladies and gentlemen, let, help me welcome Liz Ross, Chief Growth Officer of Digitas. Well, thank you. This is um, really exciting to be here with Matt and the team to really start talking about what is truly sort of the unspoken or the untalked about a crisis in the industry. I'm new to Digitas. I'm about six, six weeks in. But as you see, a huge amount of media is being bought and purchased um, by both Digitas and ultimately by uh, Viviki. Everybody, all week, you've been hearing about this. We've been talking about this for easily 10 years. Consumption is up, right? People are using multiple forms of media. They're using the internet. This is all sort of base stuff that we know. However, when you look at click-through, which is not a perfect proxy by any stretch of the imagination, but it's going down, right? It's, it's what we all know to be true even as consumers, right? Not just marketers. If I were to ask every one of you, what was the last banner you clicked on, right? You'd have a hard time answering that question. Why? What's happening and why is, this, why is this where we're at? The fragmentation, we talk about it all the time, is massive. As we were talking about this and, and preparing for it, we were talking about the Cheesecake Factory menu, right? You go into the Cheesecake Factory, the menu is 48 pages. Why is that, right? Can everything possibly be fresh? No. So you have to ask what's most popular, right? So as you, you look at it. You just shattered a, a, a dream of mine. That's <laughs> never going to be able to enjoy it again. Actually, my work here is done, then, if that's. Thank you. So as we look at the fragmentation, as we look at what has happened, this is not in response to consumer behavior. This is trying to capture consumer behavior, right? Consumers didn't start this, and then media companies tried to catch up. When we look at multitasking, all of us know, as we talked about, whether you're checking your email in the bathroom or at church, you need many more hours than you actually have in order to get things done. And in fact, when you look at sort of what is multitasking, how often are we doing it, probably everybody is sitting here thinking, if I could just send out one quick email, if I could just send one quick text. Uh, again, we're attempting to get too much done in too short a period of time. What is actually happening in the brain is fascinating, right? It's really when you have memory and you're working, you're working in your hippocampus, right? When you start to multitask, it's not that you're actually doing multiple things at the same time. Your brain is just switching, right? It's just a switch, and it's working faster. What happens is it moves to the striatum, and that's where that, that activity is happening. But what is really important for us as marketers to understand is that that means you get less learning, you have less memory. 
So when you're sitting in front of the television and you're watching and you're multitasking, you're not retaining as much, right? So for brands, Dana's here from, from Kraft. If there's a television commercial about uh, whether it's one of the cheese brands, you retain less so that when you're standing in the store and you're standing in the grocery aisle and it's either Kraft or Sargento, which one you're picking up, you no longer are retaining what brands mean in your, in your brain because, again, about how you're thinking. Great example of this, right? Everybody's, everybody heard it. Here's the interesting thing. Television used to be very dependable on appointment-based marketing, right? You used to be able to buy the VMAs and you'd know that people would sit all the way through it. Interestingly enough, Kanye gets on stage and does his crazy thing, right? Facebook lit up, right? Everybody's Facebook status is updated. So even people that weren't watching that meant people were just sitting there on Facebook updating it. Immediately, Kanye West became the number one search, right? Everybody's searching, what's going on, what's happening? Anecdotally, I saw someone just wrote Kanye West RIP, right? Picked it up, and I was like, Kanye West died? I gotta go check this out, right? So again, this is a perfect example of an event that is no longer sort of a way to capture people's attention, even in appointment-based media. Here's the other piece of this. How many of the people in the room have been involved in the production of television? A lot. How many people in the room own a DVR? Right. Right? What are we doing? What are we doing? Are you guys stopping your DVRs to, to watch television commercials? But interestingly enough, this is not just a television problem. We, also, we often talk about this as being, well, that's television, we're new media, we're digital. This is one of my favorite slides. This is a heat map. And this is how consumers look at and read online this is a news site, right, how they read it. The brain has actually adapted to allow us to not see the advertising, no matter where it is. We all know it's at the top and the left, or literally you can just skip right by it. So you see the heat map, you see how people are actually absorbing media, right? They're actually, they're able to not see it. So even if that's targeted to me, even if that says, Liz, come buy this, you want, I know you want to go to Hawaii, I'm never even going to see it. Fundamentally, the internet does not equal advertising. It is not a single vehicle, right? As we've been talking about forever, the idea of saying digital or the internet, where I'm just doing stuff on the internet, as if it's a single thing is faulty, right? Most importantly, there are things that are utilitarian, things that Matt talked about at the upfront, right? You're lost, you're looking for, you're looking for directions, you're looking for a job. That's a very different thing than if you're experiencing something, right? You're willing to sit back, you're watching something on Hulu. That is a whole different way of thinking about sort of what you're doing. So utility versus experience, it's not a single way to approach it, right? You can't look at it as a single thing. The invisible obvious, Matt talked about this. If reach is infinite and attention is scarce, why do brands buy reach? Why are we buying reach? That's an old model. We have to shift, we have to start thinking about how do we buy attention, how do we buy engagement? Bill Birnbach quote, Matt and I joked that even though neither of us are within Omnicom and DDB, we are legally obligated to share a Bill Birnbach quote. Um, if your advertising goes unnoticed, everything else is academic. Half century ago, guys still smart. Yep, yep. exactly. Thank you very much, Thank Liz. You. Okay, so that's, that's basically framing our business problem with digital media. Now, let's all take a deep breath, take a step back, and consider the concept of attention from a slightly different perspective. And I'm gonna introduce you to two of the most successful purveyors of attention in the world. They do it in a different way, but there are a lot of similarities and intersections, as you will see throughout the course of the conversation. First person I'd like to introduce is Peter Guber, and he is a Red Sox fan. And that really is most of the reason, um, I'm a huge Red Sox fan uh, myself, and Peter's obviously my hero. Uh, you own some, some teams too. Yeah, all right. Anyway, I'm off topic. Uh, Peter Guber was uh, recruited out of NYU Graduate School of Business by Columbia Pictures, and within three years became its studio chief. Following his entrepreneurial instincts, he co-formed, a formed, co-owned, and ran Casablanca Records and Filmworks. Then he formed Polygram Entertainment and served as CEO. 
After a considerable stint and successful sale, he formed GPEC, which established a major presence in motion pictures, television, and music, including the official soundtrack for the 1984 Summer Olympics. During these years, among the films he personally produced or executive produced include The Color Purple, Batman, Rain Man, Midnight Express, It's Time for Wapner, um, uh, Witches of Eastwick, Gorillas in the Mist, Flashdance, Missing, and on and on and on. These films earned more than $3 billion worldwide and garnered more than 50 Academy Award nominations. In 1989, his public company, GPEC, was purchased by Sony, and he became CEO of Sony, Sony Entertainment. Six years later, he partnered with Sony to form Mandalay Entertainment, his current venture spanning movies, TV, professional sports, and new media. The second um, luminary I would like to introduce is Brett Ratner of Brett Ratner Brands. Uh, and we're gonna talk about what that is a little bit. Uh, in a very short time, Brett has established himself as one of Hollywood's most successful directors. His feature films include Money Talks, Rush Hour, Family Man, Rush Hour 2, Red Dragon, After the Sunset, X-Men, The Last Stand, and most recently, Rush Hour 3. And I understand there may be a Beverly Hills Cop in the future. I don't know if we're allowed to talk about it. Are we allowed to talk? Okay. Okay, all right. Um, all right. Uh, uh, he, uh, Ra Mr. Ratner's also uh, had a successful career in directing music videos for artists like Madonna, Mariah Carey, Jay-Z, Mary J. Blige, Foxy, P. Diddy, and others. He refused to direct mine, but that's okay. Ratner won the MTV Music Award for the best video in a film for Madonna's Beautiful Stranger from the Austin Power soundtrack. He's established his own publishing company called Rat Press, and his career is explored on a new DVD from Genius Productions called The Shooter Series Volume 1, Brett Ratner, which features his award-winning music videos, television commercials, student films, and an overall career retrospective entitled From Hip Hop to Hollywood. Please help me welcome Peter Goober and Brett Ratner to the stage. Bruner, who is this guy? Raymond is your brother. Because you're English doesn't mean you need to hide your emotions. I'm Irish. We let people know how we feel. Now fuck off. <laughs> That's it. We got it. <laughs> that? Oh, okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, I uh, I basically grew up in Miami Beach and always dreamed of being a filmmaker since I was about eight years old. And uh, my dream came true because I got to go to NYU Film School. And um, went there, wrote a letter to 40 of the biggest people in the industry. Actually, when he was the chairman of Sony, I wrote him a letter, okay? Uh, I got a rejection letter from him. And, and 39 other people, and this I got- This is going well so yeah. far. <laughs> <laughs> and I got one letter actually from Steven Spielberg uh, saying that, uh, actually a call from Steven Spielberg, which kind of gave me a lot of confidence. And uh, out of NYU Film School, I started directing music videos. Um, and when I was 26 years old, I directed my first feature film. And since then, I've made eight feature films that uh, done pretty well. And I've uh, always been interested in, I, I feel that what I am really is a born storyteller. And I've explored so many different uh, kind of platforms of storytelling, uh, whether it's music videos, whether it's commercials, whether it's branding, whether it's um, book publishing, 
Um, I have a, a book publishing company called Rap Press. Um, I put out four books this year, um, a music video company. Um, I have a record company, believe it or not, music publishing company. Um, and now I just formed this, this uh, branding company, which was really um, for the purposes of combining creativity and connectivity. And what I mean by that is that it's not only really about my ability to, to create content, but uh, my ability to connect that story really to the most influential people in the world. And um, because I have relationships, you know, I'll tell a really quick story about uh, getting a call about a year ago from Miley Cyrus. I couldn't believe I was still relevant that Miley Cyrus was asking me to do her music video. And um, I was so excited that a 14-year-old <laughs> was like, can you do my, direct my music video, Brad? I'm like, do you even know who I am? You know? And so all my friends who had kids were very excited about this because they all got to come down to the set and meet Miley. And my, I had just got my first client from my branding uh, company who was Activision, who specifically for Guitar Hero. And um, Bobby Kotick, the chairman, uh, is a friend of mine, and he was asking me, you know, can you come up with a name for me for my, our new Guitar Hero game? And can you maybe come up with a concept for uh, the commercials for the game? So I happened to be doing this, this uh, Miley Cyrus video. And of course, Disney would never let me take a Guitar Hero and put it in the commercial without Activision paying them millions of dollars to put this Guitar Hero, guitar hero game in the, in, I'm sorry, in the music video. So at the right moment when, the photo op, when all the press were coming to take the photo op, um, of course, I'm the director, so Miley has to do whatever I say. I say, Miley, why don't you take this Guitar Hero and smash it in, you know, for the photo op. And she's like, great idea. So the minute that all the photographers are there, she takes the guitar, and I actually was running the film camera as well, and she busts the guitar. And that video is probably, the, will be, is on the way to being the biggest viewed, the largest viewed music video in history on YouTube, over 100 million views. Um, of, that, of that music video. So it's really, that's basically, to, to kind of simplify it, exactly what I've been trying to do is kind of connect what I'm doing organically, which is storytelling, making music videos, creating content for, for my friends, really, for, and uh, bringing the brands that I represent into, those, into that content in an organic, in a very natural kind of way. Um, and... Um, I'm here to talk with my buddy Peter because we just I love I love going on his show and uh, debating with him about about the movie business about you know about creativity about uh, and I learned, he's a he's a mentor of mine I learn a lot from him and I and I, I and I really enjoy uh, uh, having commentary with him and and it's really it's really fun so that's why I'm here and I'm excited to talk to you guys. Thanks. Hi, I'm Peter Guber. Uh, I've been plying my trade for. 40 years, since 1968, when I came to Columbia Pictures, and only in the last few years um, have I come to really appreciate the power of words in a page, the power of the narrative, the power of the story. And uh, joining you today and talking about attention, I have particular views about it. I've been teaching at UCLA, I'm co-chair of the film program, digital media program, and I teach courses, interdisciplinary courses. And one of the courses we teach is the power of narrative. And uh, that power of narrative is so expressed across all platforms, not just technology platforms, but human platforms. We have Deepak Chopra come to the class and talk about the power of narrative in medicine. Or you have Wolfgang Puck come to the class and talk about the power of narrative in expressing it through food and the restaurant. Or you have Tony Robbins talking about personal enhancement. Or you have any of the folks that we've had from medicine, law, business, talk about how powerful narrative is in moving human beings. Because he is in the same business as I am in. We're in the emotional transportation business. We're not in the information business. You know, information is not resonant and memorable. Attention is one thing. I have some bones to pick with the word attention. There's so much being bombarded and convulsed in our brain. Our brain width is just convulsed with incoming. How do you cut through that? How do you turn attention into intention. That's what you really want. You want intention. You want them to intend to act on your attention that you're giving them. And we do that, and he does it masterfully with movies and brands and things he's done with selling Steve Wynn on the top of his, his tower. <laughs> he knows how to integrate that and how to convert that attention to intention. 
But what I learned and what I talk about through my businesses, the businesses that I'm involved with now, new media businesses, I have a company called, uh, that I'm involved with, Geek Chic Daily, we talk to, to unique consumers, their attention, that narrow group of attention, because everybody you reach today, as a brand purveyor, as a product purveyor, everybody you reach today is a PR agent. Because it wasn't like 10 years ago. It's the minute they like something, they press a button on their iPhone or their Facebook or their Twitter, and suddenly 600, 5,000, 2,000 people know about it instantaneously. Word of mouth is now a technological tsunami. Hmm. So that what, what I have been coaching my students at business school and film school and been doing in my products and businesses is recognizing that that attention that Beta Wave is talking about is crucial, but turning it into intention. And it has to be authentic. It has to be authentic. The authenticity must shine through from the purveyor of the product, of the brand, of the story, of the narrative. If that movie isn't authentic, doesn't feel authentic, it feels like it's pandering to the audience, they'll dismiss it. Mm. So quick, so fast, that you won't get to the second weekend. Mm. So the idea is authenticity must shine through. And you have to recognize that it isn't one audience, it's many different audiences. Mm. Many different ones. Who is the audience? Who are the audience? Who are the people that you're talking to? That's what we learned today. You have to know who that audience is. Don't try to reach everybody. Just try to reach your core audience and let them viral market for you. And let, you, let the audience know your goal. Don't hide it. Make sure we learn that make sure the audience understands your goal. When you hide something, they feel a sense of secrecy, a distrust. And then recognize it's no longer you and me. It's, you, it's me and you turning into we. That the audience is no longer, shh, be quiet. They are talking to you. So all of those elements work with his businesses and really robust businesses that he's built using these, these philosophies, using his philosophies. And that's what made me interested in being involved with Beta Wave. That's what made me interested in being involved with a small company I had, Geek Chic Daily, which is a, like Daily Candy, is a talking to a unique group of people with their voice about things they are interested in to turn that attention into intention and have products be aligned and assessed through that audience to the greater world. So the whole concept of, of attention to me is really correct, but it's really saying you have to get their intention if you want more than a first mm -hmm. weekend. Mm -hmm. so, so guys, look, you, you tell stories mm -hmm. that people pay, yeah. from what I understand at the theaters, 50, 60, 70 dollars yeah. per ticket to, to see. <laughs> no, you, you, you tell stories that people really want mm -hmm. to experience. On the other side, you have a story to tell about soap, mm -hmm. you know, or mm -hmm. toilet paper, mm -hmm. okay? And people aren't necessarily gonna pay money to see it. Mm -hmm. How do you bring those two together? How do you get that same Miley Cyrus guitar hero? <laughs> Is it as simple as saying, hey, put this soap in your next film, Brett, please, and make sure the logo's turn <laughs> the right way? Well, we were talking about this earlier, Peter and I, and, and Peter was saying, Okay, if, if you were Tom Cruise and I was Cameron Diaz, well, I'd rather be Cameron Diaz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were Tom Cruise, and, 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 and Peter was saying, well, if, if we're sitting in a scene in a movie and there's a Coke bottle right here. Pepsi, Pepsi. I'm sorry, Pepsi, yeah. Pepsi bottle here. Okay, but that's why, that's why it's Coke, because Coke is not gonna get. Oh yeah, right, no, Coke, Coke's right. not gonna get this recognized. This is a bad story, right. Coke is, is, is no one's gonna look at that Coke yeah, bottle. They're right. gonna be looking at Cameron Diaz, who's gorgeous, right? Mm -hmm. And Tom Cruise, who's a movie star, obviously. And th there's not gonna be any attention to this. So I think it's important um, that, and even if, if say, say Cameron was drinking the Pepsi, okay? It's not going to serve any purpose. I was just telling Peter, I was because we were having this debate about Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz and which one would we want to be. And I said, you know, what's interesting. When I was a kid, the o <clears throat> the only car I dreamed about every day to have when I turned 16, and my parents couldn't afford it, but the only car I wanted was a Porsche 928. Why? Because Tom Cruise in Risky Business, okay, stole that car from his dad. There is no okay? substitute. There is no substitute. So it was, it, it was the fact that that car was integrated so well into that story that I didn't feel like I was being sold a Porsche. I didn't feel like I was being uh, pitched, like, okay, the Porsche is cool. It was an integral part of that story. Yeah. And uh, that I was, I, and because I fell in love with the character. Uh, Tom Cruise's character. I fell in love with the characters and fell in love with the, with the car because it was part of that story. It was a character within that story. A Coke bottle, or Pepsi, we'll, we won't say the word Coke again, a Pepsi, a Pepsi bottle in that, in, that, in that scene is not have a character. It's just a prop. 
It's just somebody sitting in the room that's not speaking and it's not interesting. Um, but to make that integral to the story is going to get people saying, God, I want to drink that Pepsi because that's cool. Because that yeah, character yeah. is cool drinking. And you know what it is? What he's doing is, as a filmmaker, he's rendering an experience to the audience, not giving them information. Right. And embedded in that experience is that product. Your reticular activating system it doesn't focus on things. It eliminates things that aren't of the experience. That Coke bottle wasn't of the experience, so it, do it doesn't get seen. It doesn't, it isn't, you're not aware of it. But what he does is render an experience. Audience expects experiences. They don't expect information. If he aimed his films at their head or, his, or somebody's wallet, that's where flops are born. Yeah. You gotta aim at their heart, right. and then it migrates to their head, where a hit is born. So the idea is, what he's saying is so crucial, we watched it all, so many times, <laughs> where people try to put products in, 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 into movies, into television, into, into internet products, it just doesn't work, but the audience doesn't see it. It has the, to be part and, of the experience. And there's so much of a disconnect. There's not any studio heads here from movie studios, are there? Okay, well I wanna say. You're good. <laughs> there's a disconnect here because what happens is these brands are going to these studios, they're creating this huge amount of content and they're saying, okay, and I don't mean to. to, to, to Tell them that uh, story about, about, about uh, X-Men and the okay. car, right? So, so, you know, these studios are making deals with brands and brands are offering them millions and millions of dollars in marketing dollars and all this stuff. And, you know, Fox comes to me, the chairman of Fox says, we made a deal with Mercedes. Now, it just so happens that I love Mercedes and that I needed a Mercedes. As you saw in that scene in the beginning, I wanted the old school, that's my favorite car in the whole world, that old 600 Mercedes, you know, that I thought. So much for brand loyalty. I thought you loved Porsche. Well, no, but I, 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 okay. want, I wanted All to right. own a Porsche, All right. okay. but I wanted a Mercedes for this story because okay. it fit this character. All okay. right. And so they said, well, I said, that works. So they said, well, we want to do a deal with Mercedes Benz. Now, because Fox, I think the dollar, the buy was like $20 million, some huge dollar amount just to put a Mercedes in the movie. And because, and Mercedes had some requirements. They wanted to have footage from the movie to show it in Detroit at their convention or something. And the chairman of Fox said, F you, I'm not giving you shit. Said, I'm, you know, we're not ready to give the footage. We're not ready to show the footage to anybody. And there wasn't a, a, a relationship there. Now, that car, not that car, but the, another Mercedes, because that was the car that I, I wanted to use in That's the cool. film, was in the film, was a character in the film, and was in the film for like 15 minutes, okay? Nobody forced me to do it. Now they didn't end up giving the studio a dime, okay? Not one penny, and they didn't spend any marketing dollars, but I wanted the car in the film. And there were so many other brands that they were coming to me, these guys from the studio would come down in these suits and would say, can you get this 7-Eleven Slurpee in this scene right here? I go, no. <laughs> It's not gonna happen, and you can't force me to do it. And that's the problem, that all these brands are making these deals with, with studios, and there's no way that a studio, and, and by the way, they might be able to get the product in the movie, but again, it's not gonna serve the purpose because it's not gonna be organic to the story. So how do we resolve this? I don't really know the, the answer exactly, but I know that if brands are reaching out and, having, and has relationships, with the content creators, with the creative community, because when I'm sitting there with my writer, I'm coming up with the concept for, say, Beverly Hills Cop, right? Now, Eddie has to drive a cool car, okay? And it's really a matter of personal choice, but whatever car I think, now, all the car dealers can come to me and go, ooh, I got the new Ferrari, I got the new this, but it has to kind of work within the story. So for me to make it really organic to that story, it has to be a car that makes sense. Um, if it's a car that he, you know, that he steals, or if it's a car that he, 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 he borrows from somebody, it has to kind of fit the narrative. And if it fits the narrative, then it's gonna, be, it's gonna do what, what, what Porsche did when I was a kid and I saw Risky Business. So um, I think that's my answer really on how to kind of make that work. Well, what company do you have or you started that kind of reflects that philosophy, Is you, 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 that, it, that it kind of evidences it for us? It, it's, it's, it's my branding company, Brett Ratner Brands, and because when I have a relationship, now, Activision did not ask me to put the Guitar Hero in the Miley Cyrus video, but it was organic to that music video. I also did it with Mariah Carey, for instance. Mariah Carey comes to me and always says, can you do my music videos? And I say, okay. She says the same thing yeah. to me. <laughs> and, and, you know, my, to me a music video is not just a promotion for a single, okay? It's, it's a marketing proposition. It's an opportunity for me to kind of take the brands that I have relationships with and incorporate them. So I recognize that Mariah Carey videos normally get two or three million views on YouTube. And I'm like, okay, what is big on the internet, okay? Humor is a big thing. Storytelling with a beginning, middle, and end, okay? And of course, celebrity and music, 
Okay? So I say, okay, well, Mariah Carey is not quite a comedian. All right? So let me go get Jack McBrayer from 30 Rock, who I think is very funny, create a story about a geek who falls in love with Mariah Carey. It's his fantasy of being with Mariah Carey. Now, his fantasy of being with Mariah Carey is not to make, be making love to her, and I can't do that in a music video anyway, right? His fantasy is a geek fantasy. What is that geek fantasy? To be playing Guitar Hero with Mariah Carey. Right. That's his fantasy, okay? And so I put that guitar, so organically that guitar fit. Now, Guitar Hero didn't ask me to do this. This is something that just comes with me having them as a client. You know? right. And so that's why I've been able to kind of connect the brands that I'm working with into the content that I'm creating and not making it feel forced or contrived. So now I'm coming up with this new big franchise, Beverly Hills Cop, which is a huge priority for Paramount. They're gonna spend hundreds of millions of dollars you know, in marketing and promotion and making this movie. And I know that Eddie Murphy, when he's in his, you know, is gonna be, and whoever else is with him, whatever other actors are with him, they're gonna to have to be in a car. So I need a car, so I'm thinking, okay, I don't have a, a car client. You know, so what car is gonna, fit into this narrative that I'm gonna make. It's not the reverse. It's not like, how do I take you know, if someone, a Mercedes and make it work into the story? What, do I, what are my needs for the story? How am I gonna make that, kind of, that car become a character in my story? And the reality of that is that the audience, the audience who expects an experience sees the fraudulence of that yes. in the film, and it actually affects the film. Yeah. It disassociates you from the film. It, it fractures the sense, suspension of disbelief. It looks like a commercial. Yeah. It looks like an advertisement. The whole it purpose of a film is to, is, to, is to make people feel like they're not watching a film, right? They're in the moment. They're watching you know, a character interact with another character in a real situation, unless it's a farcical, really broad movie. But the perfect example really is if, you know, I'm watching, say, a, a, a movie uh, with a black guy and a white guy, or a white guy driving down the street in his car, and all of a sudden, a black guy comes and, and, and robs him, a cliched scene of, of uh, Martin Lawrence. I remember this movie, I don't remember specifically, but he'll jump in the car and he's, he's about to rob him, right? Uh, I think it was Tim Robbins. And all of a sudden, rap music comes on the radio. It just is so contrived and it's a perfect example. And, it's, and I think audiences sense that, you know? Um, and it just doesn't fit the narrative, the story that it's telling. It feels, it's a cliche of what the narrative is. So it's important that brands understand that, uh, that in order to, get an, a, a kid, like when I was a kid, and I saw that Porsche 928, and I had to have that Porsche, and I would talk to all my friends about it, and I would always, you know, it, was, it, it became kind of a viral thing. It's like, isn't, in class, isn't the Porsche, did you see Risky Business? Did you see that car? Did you see how cool that was? In order to create that excitement and that fervor, I think, in, in movies specifically, I think you need to kind of make sure that that, that product is integrated in a, in, a, in, a natural, in a natural way. So let me ask you guys this. I mean, from, from Risky Business or Rain Man to yeah. today, yeah. Have, have the audiences changed? Like, you're, you're talking about, you, you know, the goal is for you to have these audiences completely enthralled, yeah. right? For however long it is, two mm -hmm. hours. Is that harder today? Is it different today? Like, what, what's the, has the bar been set higher on the consumer side for mm -hmm. capturing that, that kind of attention? Well, I think that you have to recognize that you have so many more means of reaching your consumer. Now, mm -hmm. You again use the word consumer. I like to use the word audience because to me, they expect an experience. A consumer expects you to go for his wallet. Good point. You know? So the idea is when you are looking at an audience, you say to yourself, I've got to get their attention back to what you're yeah. doing. And today, you have a very narrow window to get their attention. Just take our business, for mm -hmm. example. Just a few years ago, when we grew up in the business, I made movies in these Witches of Eastwick. It played for 14 or 15 weeks in <laughs> New York City. Yeah. 14 or 15 weeks. And it took a while for the word of mouth to get around, for the critics to get their reviews, mm -hmm. for the audience to get its peer group pressure, to go, to spread the core audience to a wider view. Mm -hmm. They kept it in the theaters. They maybe expanded it to more screens or reduced it to less screens, but they kept it its presence. Today, it's like a nano flash. We said, an, a hit today, or a flop, a hit, you walk around, you gotta do it real quick because you gotta capture everything in that short time. A flop, used to walk, I used to walk around with a flop and it stick to my head like this. <laughs> That's your head. Did you make that film? Did you make that film? You made that film? Who's that, who's that girl? And from restaurants, people recognize you. You know, today, a flop disappears in two seconds. Yeah. It disappears. Yeah. So you have a very short window in which to move your product 
tr convert your awareness yeah. into trust and relationship, convert that trust and relationship into a buying experience. Yeah. So you have to think of it differently, mm. you have to approach it differently. It is, it is no longer that light at the end of the tunnel that you're gonna get your arms around. You wait for that, it'll consume yeah. you. The, uh, it's interesting is because the social networks, I mean, what's done is wh the way that movies used to work really is that, and the hits, is it was a word of mouth. Before yeah. the internet, it was word of mouth, right? It was like people said, oh, I want to, you know, either the marketing campaign that was on TV that they were buying, but really, if people had seen the movie the first weekend, if it was a great movie, word of mouth. Now, if it was a bad movie, you got that opening weekend because the marketing yeah. for that movie opened that movie, right? Now, with Twitter, you know, <laughs> In the first screening at noon, you know, especially a comic book franchise or something big, I mean, on that Wednesday before the Friday, you know, people are already Twittering, don't go see it, it's a piece of crap, right? So During it, the filming process, people are talking about it, right? Are, I mean, even before it releases. Yeah, but I mean, they, but, but even watching, <laughs> I mean, yeah, while the they're theater, watching, right, watching right. the movie, and that thing is viral and spreading. So, so it's, it, it, it's a, you know, hits aren't lasting. But bombs, the good thing, the, the, the flip side of that is that bombs aren't lasting right. as well, which is what he's saying. He had, had, he had a bomb and he has to walk around with it like, grow, like a growth on his neck. And, and it was, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating thing. And because, you know, movies are not, when I was a kid, I rem, I'll never forget this, I went to see Star Wars, okay? I literally had to wait online for two days. And when I say wait online, my mom would drop me off at the one theater, okay? Yeah. And there was a line down the block, and I, find, and I didn't make it to the next, and I had to go home by the time for dinner, by the time I got to the end of the line. I had to go home, not sleep all night, be so excited because everyone was talking, my friends were talking about it, yeah. and then go back the next day. Now there's no lines. You walk into a multiplex, there's 18 screens. You know, I go with my grandparents every Sunday to the movie, and, and we just walk in, we just, you know, there's eight showings of a, of a big hit, so. It, tur it, tur it turned turned the multiplex into a simulplex. They used to have all 16 movies were playing that were released in the summer in that one theater. Yeah. Now, two movies are playing there at 7, 705, 710, 720, 725, yeah. 730, 735, and there's only two movies So now. there's not, a, the phenomenon of having, of the, of, of the urgency of having to wait in line for a movie has gone. It's completely changed, you know. And the idea of immediacy, so you see that glow in the theater. You know what that glow in the theater is? People on their, on their phones, mm. that glow telling somebody when the movie's half through, Half through the first first day. Now just think about this. Now and that's they, helpful if it's a, if it's a great movie. It, it, yeah, but <laughs> it's, it's the pain and the joy. They're very close together now. But here's right. an interesting element that just an anecdotal element. When I grew up in the movie business, in fact, even more recently, just ten years ago, you know, you'd, you'd, a movie would cost you know, ten, twelve, nine, fourteen. The average cost of a movie today is seventy nine million dollars. This room, a $79 million, I'm doing the movie in this room, it's $79 million. And another 75 to, to, to market and release it world, worldwide. Average. Average. You take, I'll give you two films, take Spider-Man 3, it was $300 million plus uh -huh. to make, and Avatar is over $350 million with $150 million of prints and ads worldwide. 500 with a B, 500, half a billion dollars investment. Now listen to this. Before you'd wait two weeks to find out what happened, here's what happens. On Friday, all say opens on a Friday, the first show they say is at 12 o'clock, I'm picking a time. Mm -hmm. By three o'clock that afternoon, after the first matinees, mm -hmm. and not released in 40 theaters, released in 9,000 theaters around the world, mm -hmm. the numbers come in and they model the entire per performance. The entire performance. Now, if you don't think that gives the executives in that company sphincter arrest of what's going to happen <laughs> that day, it changes their day ma you know, majorly. So the idea is everything's happening in this compressed time. Not just the attention, but the attention of the attention, the intention of the attention. Everything is squeezed in. And so what he has to face is he has to keep his brand and his movies kind of in tow until he can let them blossom, let them fly out. So it's a very difficult time about creating awareness, mm -hmm. attention, and then perception, mm -hmm. what it's about, and turn that into transaction. And then the brand inside of it to turn that mm -hmm. into you wanting to be associated with that product mm -hmm. by buying that car or buying that, mm -hmm. that shirt or buying that Coca-Cola. Well, I try to do, I try to do the, the, I recognize with all this multimedia, whatever you call it, multi-platforms, that I think it's, a lot, it's very similar to, if I look at history, is what the printing press did, okay? Uh, the printing press, you know, did not really change storytelling. The printing press just gave more people access to the story. And that's what all this multimedia is doing. So I think at the end of the day, you can't get caught up in all that. You have to say, what is the big idea? 
What are you trying to sell? What is the story you're trying to tell? The media should service that idea. Okay, so if you have an ad, ad agency who is only focusing on the media, uh, maybe they're not the right ad, ad agency for you. Then again, if an ad agency has a specific target, like his geek or a, a business that has a specific kind of focus, that's good uh, on another level as well. Mm -hmm. But I think the important thing is that you focus on what is the story you're trying to tell? How are you gonna entertain these people? When I go in every, I treat every scene in a movie like a mini movie. In, in my film, like a mini movie with a beginning, middle, and end. And I think that's really the secret. How do you grab someone's attention? I mean, I created this, this TV series called Prison Break, and um, I wanted to you know, create something that was gonna get people's attention, that hold, hold on to them. Because the truth is, it's a different time, obviously, we all know this, but when I was a kid, you know, uh, I mean, I have the worst ADD ever. And why my movies are so successful, I think, is because of my ADD. Because, I, you know, if I have to look at my watch or if I want to get up and go to the bathroom. Um, um, Warren Beatty told me a great story a while ago that he, when he did Bonnie and Clyde, he went into, who did he make that for? Was it Jack Warner? Was it Warner no, Brothers? Bonnie and Clyde was, it was Warner's. Warner's, okay. So Jack Warner was a crotchety old guy and he came into the screening room and Warren was notorious for kind of making long movies. And Jack Warner says, this better not be a long film. Right? So, he, right, or I'm gonna tell you to cut it down. So, so he, they screen the movie, and Jack Warner gets up to go to the bathroom three times during the film. And he comes back in, the light's going, he goes, Warren, this is a three piss movie. <laughs> cut it down to a one piss movie, or I'm not gonna release it. All right? And that's the thing, is like, I don't, you know, I make short films because of my attention span, because I grew up with a short attention span, and I want to tell the story in the simplest way possible, with the least amount of shots, with the least amount of complexities. I want to connect to the audience, okay? And, uh, and that's the thing, is that I think it's important to, in whatever media it is, how do you connect to the audience? And, and that's with the idea. The execution is important as well. And the audience, you have to think about, don't think of audience, everybody out there. Figure out what your core audience, yeah. your really core audience is. I know what I said with Geek Chic Daily, we figured these particular people, deliver them with an authentic voice and let them do the work for you. Let them spread the message. Let them widen the core audience to a large audience. Let them create peer group pressure. Don't try to service everyone, one size fits all. It isn't that way anymore. And the reality, I think the reality is that the audience wants to talk back. You remember in the movie they said, shh, don't talk, don't talk. And you go to a black theater and they're all screaming and yelling at the screen. <laughs> That's what they want to do. They want to interact. They want to interactivity. That's what we're yeah. living in that world. So start with the business objective is what you're saying. Figure out what the marketing strategy mm -hmm. is and then connect those with the idea. And, and the key to this, I think the key to this is recognizing there's no one God. One of the courses we gave on information technology, we had Chad Hurley in, who was the chairman and CEO of YouTube. And we were talking about this God of technology. And he, he said something that was really interesting. He said, now nobody goes for O's and ones. They go for O's and ahs. Right. At the end of the day, we're all analog. You know, in other words, the idea is technology shortens the distance mm. between the artist, the product purveyor, mm. and the audience, the consumer. They sh it shortens the distance. But the same requirements exist. You must aim mm. at their experience. You must aim at their heart. You must render them an experience. If you want the message, the brand, the content, the logo to be resonant and memorable, and most important for you, actionable, that they'll do something. Mm. And that's what you have to do. So I think, guys, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, a way to restate it would almost be brands need to be the experience, not the interruption of the mm -hmm. experience, mm -hmm. but the, you know, something that's foisted on them. But brands need to be that experience Absolutely. itself. I think brands should, should find the most entertaining thought that comes directly from their business objective. And they need to work with Brett Bratner Brands uh, yes. <laughs> I like and that. Peter Goober. All right, guys, please help me thank Peter and Brett. That was awesome, guys.